Hey there! Thank you for tuning into Duck Bricks. I'm Chris, and welcome to another episode of Bionicle Fan and Reviews, where I review all the fan created, canonized Bionicle models. These are not official sets, but typically they are models that have been officially accepted into the G1 canon, either via official LEGO sponsored contests or the more modern TTV canonization contests. However, this one is an exception to the rule. This model in particular is not officially canon. However, I am choosing to review it for a few reasons, and I will explain those criteria as follows. I'll review any model that I view as sufficiently close enough to a canon depiction, but unlikely to ever get a canon contest. You see, this model is the Batera, and we saw the Batera, but only as drawings. The Batera only appeared in a certain Bionicle comic book, which was released in 2009, and we never actually got a physical build for what they would look like. As such, since we already have an image depiction of them, it's highly unlikely that there will ever be a canonization contest for the Batera model, especially because there's so many other characters who only appeared on the pages of text and would need a canonization contest much more to give them any image at all. And as such, obviously, I don't even think we're ever going to get a canon contest for this model. So I searched and found the best possible representation of what this model could look like based on that one drawing in the comic. As it turns out, the best one that I found is this Patera built by Wombat Combat Pictures. You may recognize his name on this channel because he was actually the person that designed the Artaka model, which is canon via the TTV canonization contest, and he also designed the Karzani model who's Artaka's brother, not strictly canon, but again, the same exact scenario as this model here, where it's very unlikely that we'll get a canon contest to depict a build version of that model, but instead, he was only featured as a drawing, which is why I figured it'd be okay to run a canon review on it. And so, without further ado, let me just jump into the story of the Batera. These were augmented creatures designed to hunt down and kill anyone wielding any sort of weapon. The Batera were made by the Great Beings in a last-ditch effort to stop the war. There had been a core war raging across Spherus Magna for years, and eventually the Great Beings were like, you know what, let's just have them kill anyone hostile to essentially stop anyone from being hostile anymore. If we kill literally everyone holding a weapon or being willing to wield weapons, then there should be no problem with the war because no one's going to be fighting each other. That was kind of the logic that they applied to the Batera. So these creatures were specifically hunting the Skrull, because of course these Skrull are kind of warmongers, they're a very warrior-style race, and they were frequently hunted by the Batera, who were targeting anyone wielding a weapon. These were fearsome creatures with cloaking technology, so you wouldn't actually be able to tell where they were coming from, and the white armor actually allowed them to blend into heavy snowstorms, especially in the mountainous regions where many of these Skrull were hiding. Because of this, really any Skrull who was riding a mount outside of the mountainous terrain could run the risk of running into a pack of Batera or an entire squad of them who would very quickly decimate them. There was a ton of cool backstory and artwork that went into these guys, and it was especially near the end of the Bionicle storyline, which is a shame because I actually do suspect we may have actually gotten these as a set had they actually have been continued in the Bionicle storyline. But so, let's just dive in right into the model. I actually do want to note a few things. While Wombat Combat Pictures designed this, he specifically wanted me to mention that it is based off of an original design by Lewis Hammond, which you can see up on screen right here. This model right here was actually designed by its creator to be as close to an official set as possible, even including a Thornax launcher. What Wombat Combat Pictures did is that he took the base template of the model and basically improved it to make it a lot more sophisticated, have a lot more details, and be overall a general improvement over that model, which is why I've chosen to review this one over that one. That being said, he still took heavy inspiration from that model, so I definitely do want to credit both builders. And so without further ado, let me describe exactly how I categorize these models. Number one is posability, so how well can I get this into poses? Is it easy to pose? Can it hold the weight of its own weapons and stand up straight? Number two is building techniques, so how well is this built? Is this just recycling stuff from sets, or is it actually trying something new? Number three is overall aesthetics, so does this look cool? Does this look menacing? Does this look like a warrior that seems like a tough opponent? And number four is how well does it fit in universe? 
For this model in particular, I'll be doing something a little bit more interesting because of course we actually do have an image of him. So I will be directly comparing him against the image in the comic book to see just how close it is to that image. But so without further ado, let's just dive straight into the review of Wombat Combat Pictures Batera model. Okay, so let's start things off with a 360 degree turnaround of Wombat Combat Pictures Batera model. You can immediately see this is a lot more refined than many of the models we typically review on this show, specifically because it was, well, made by a talented mockist and not a child. That's not to say that all of the other builds I've reviewed are far worse than this, you can just see a level of sophistication in this build that typically is not present in many of the canon models, especially from the Dark Hunters and Rahi guidebooks, which again were made from a contest aimed for children. What's really nice about this one is that I feel like it includes CCBS pieces alongside Bionicle pieces in a very realistic matter that honestly doesn't even feel like there's any sort of style clash. I can very easily see those rock pieces on his knees and those spikes working very well with the Knight's Kingdom mace spikes as well as the LX spike claws on the hands there. So everything really blends quite well together and that statement also applies to the color scheme which is remarkably consistent. There's silver slash gray, dark blue, and white and that's pretty much the only different colors that you would ever see on this build besides a pinch of black here and there for the internal components. Overall, it's a very solid build, both color blocking wise and in terms of design, and I'm quite excited to get into this for the review. So let's just remove it from the rotating stand here and start to take a look at the model just in terms of the posability for point number one. Alright, so let's just start off with the simplest part which are the hands. You can immediately see that these are basically jointed as much as you would expect different hands to be. You can move them up and down, but then you can also bend them at the elbow. It doesn't really have individual hands, it just has these claw hands, which honestly I'm kind of fine with because as you can see in the artwork depicted in the comics, that's exactly how they looked as well. These things didn't really have hands of their own. The one thing that I will say is a little bit frustrating, although I don't know exactly how the builder would have gone around this, is that, as you can see, you can't really lift the arm past this particular point, just because of the way that the friction socket is mounted. That means that if you actually want to lift it so it's extending its arm out, you kind of have to do something funky, or you have to bend it to the side and then go like this, which honestly looks a little bit awkward. I would have really liked it if I could actually bend this up, without just separating it out. Something like this would have been nice. Then again, not really sure how else you would have mounted the piece. Maybe if it extended a little bit further out of the piece here and was mounted sideways, then that could have been a better way to mount it. But then again, it would have added a lot more bulk to this model. So I can see why it wasn't mounted like that. Moving on to the arm though, the one thing that I do actually like is that the elbow is pretty much fixed at a 90 degree angle, which is very realistic for an arm. You can still get this into really cool poses, I mean as you can see here, you can really get it stretched out in different ways without actually feeling too too limited by this bend, and I'm actually pretty impressed by that, especially because again, you really only have two points of articulation for the hands, but you can still get this into really cool poses. And that's one thing I really do like about this. You can have it say, putting up its claws in defense, maybe preparing for an attack going like this to strike. All sorts of different unique poses you can get out of this relatively smaller model, which are achieved despite the limits of articulation in the arms. When we move on to the head though, the head is actually mounted on an additional ball joint. You can see here it uses a CCBS extension piece to really allow you to move the head around. Unfortunately, again, because of the way this is mounted, you're kind of restricted to just going back and forth like this. Let me show you right here. This is basically the most you can move it back and forth. If you want to move it more, it'll start pulling the socket out of the axle here. So this one gives you a little bit more articulation, but you can see that axle start to pull out. So that's not entirely legal. Although again, not really sure of a better way to do this. Maybe if you wanted to mount it like this, then you could have a full range of articulation, but then you're slightly limited by going up and down. So definitely some trade-offs here and there. Although I do like how much you can actually articulate the head for the joint that it's given. 
And finally, as we move on down to the legs here, you'll notice that it actually has a lot more joints in the legs, specifically to represent that kind of centaur type leg, the digitigrade leg appearance that it had in the comics, which is always very cool, makes something look a little bit more alien. Obviously, the middle segment of the leg is just a standard Toa Metru leg piece, so nothing too crazy going on there. But I do actually appreciate the attempts to spice up some of the standard limbs. If we look at this limb right here, the lowest one, it uses the standard Visorak limb piece in dark blue, but it also has these extra add-on Throbot feet on the back here to add some kind of extra color detail, and it even fills in some of the gaps on the front by using the standard white Borok eyes, or Fenrak teeth, on the front here which actually do give it a lot more bulk. The upper parts of the legs arguably are a lot more interesting because they're built out of completely separate configurations and I just demonstrated one slight con of them as you can see this is just mounted on one single axle so if you're not careful with it it can kind of tend to fall off but only if you really try to mess around with it a lot Typically, it stays together. That's actually one thing I really do like about the leg construction. It expertly integrates the CCBS tile here and the CCBS rock armor alongside this deceptively simple Technic construction. All it is is just a Mata hand wrapped around some other Technic elements to essentially make it so that you can bend the leg completely. And it's actually a really clever way of building it up while making it feel flush against the CCBS armor piece. All in all, very good use of parts here, and typically, while I do love CCBS, I will admit that it's not the best when used for Bionicle G1 mocks, the style just doesn't quite fit, but in this instance, I think it fits pretty well. Onto the feet here, it just uses kind of a similar technique to the original set that the feet came out in, which was of course Makuta Biddle. It has a pretty similar construction in the way that it's attached, but I really don't have any complaints. Nothing too crazy going on here for the feet, but it is nice that it has these claw tips that again, the choice of the Biddle claw pieces really well reflect the Alex Spikes, the Knight's Kingdom Mace armor, and even the Hero Factory Bruiser armor right there. But then we can kind of shift focus from articulation to building techniques. I do want to say the final thing in terms of articulation and posability. You'll notice that I'm having zero problems letting this guy stand up straight, which if you're in any way familiar with any of my other reviews, you may have seen my major, major frustrations with models simply not standing up. Thankfully, since this one is relatively short in stature and is generally well balanced, you will have basically no problems getting this to stand up, and even beyond that, you'll have basically no problems getting it into really interesting poses, even if you have the legs completely splayed out in different ways. You can see here that I have the legs in this very unique kind of get up right here. They're very much splayed out at odd angles and it's still not falling over. It's still holding the weight of its own body, even if you do crazy things with the weight distribution on the arms. So in general, I'm pretty happy with the posability on this, despite some minor quibbles with the upper arms just not being able to bend all the way up, and just some restrictions in the head movement, I generally would say that posability wise this is very good, and at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if there are restrictions on the tops of the arms if you can actually get it into good poses, which I would argue you definitely can. So let's move on from articulation to now talking about building techniques. So the one thing I haven't mentioned, of course, is the torso because, well, I mean, that one really just generally falls under building techniques. While this uses the standard Inika frame, you can see it just uses the standard leg piece and the Inika upper chest piece, there have been several attempts to differentiate it from other Bionicle models with a similar frame, and honestly, I think that they definitely succeeded. This torso really does make it stand out amongst all of the other Inika builds, mostly in part of, and I'm going to remove the arm here so we can see it a little bit better, but the hunchback that's induced by the formation of this Technic element here that fits perfectly in with the Inika torso, you have this Technic beam extending the neck outwards, causing it to have kind of a hunchback-like look, and that honestly does a lot in terms of differentiating this from other Inika-style builds. The other thing that's really nice is that basically this is very much well cladded up. The other thing that's really nice is that this is very well cladded up all around the torso. 
Putting the arm back here, you'll notice that they didn't just use the standard Krika chest plate and the Toa Metru armor, but the builder also included these Borok tooth or Borok eye pieces along the sides, which almost give it a suggestion of ridged armor, which honestly looks really good and actually serves a completely functional purpose, which you can see here. You could even interpret this as maybe some scales or fur to hint at their cloaking abilities. Even moving on to the back, despite having a pretty technic heavy construction near the neck here, it is well cladded up. You've got another one of those white throwbot feet in the back to really round off the back here, as well as a shoulder armor piece used as a back armor, which is used pretty well, and does actually leave basically no gaps in between this upper technic construction and the rest of the torso. All in all, I think the torso is constructed remarkably well, and it definitely is one of the more unique Inika builds that you can do. I think this is a great example to show people that you can actually do new and unique things with the Inika torso build, just if you're creative about it and try to do unique things. Not every single mock absolutely needs a completely unique Technic-based torso. There are ways that, as you can see here, you can modify the standard Inika design to make it stand out and pop a lot more. The addition of the LEGO studs to add some white detailing is just icing on the cake here. The one other thing I do really want to point out is that, again, LEGO studs are used in between these two Technic pieces here to really fill in the gap between these two Technic lift arms and really make the hand feel like a solid object. I also really like the usage of the leg or arm armor here from the Anika builds, which has been expertly used to cover the back side of the hand, and I really like the addition of this smaller silver Bora claw here to almost act like a thumb compared to the longer Elec claws. Things being constructed well also extends to the arms here, which you'll notice are a little bit more complex than you may seem. As you can see here, they use the older friction joint here, but have a ton of Technic lift arms used to connect and adhere all these pieces well together. I really like the use of this mace piece on top of the standard Inika armor, really makes it stand out and almost makes it feel like a completely unique element. And again, while we discuss this a little bit while talking about the legs, I have very few complaints about how the legs are constructed, other than if you kind of press your finger down here or move the armor around, it's really easy to pop this front leg armor off. It's not really adhered too, too strongly, but again, it's a very compact design, and I think that the sacrifice is made to make it a little bit easier to pop off, but actually look aesthetically really good, definitely paid off in the end. And speaking of general aesthetics, I think that this is done remarkably well. It looks very, very menacing. It also looks like a nimble and lean fighter, which is kind of the vibe that it got from the the comics as well. It's by no means a hulking monstrosity to take down, but you can see that having these in great numbers would pose a significant threat to any armed warrior who would face them, just like in the story. The other thing I really like is that it gives off this completely alien vibe, gives it kind of an appearance that this is not one character that fits in with the other Glatorian or the other Toa even. This was designed by something pretty alien. It has a completely different construction for the way that the legs work. The claws are very animal-like, so all in all, it's very well done in terms of a build. And I didn't even mention how well the mask or the helmet fits on this character. Of course, this has been designed by the legendary King K, who thank you again for providing us with all of these comic and lore accurate designs. Really well done job on this as usual, but the mask having these spikes sticking out and these lines going along the back really fit well alongside the rest of the build. And I think that this is one of the best iterations of a Batera that I've seen online yet. But now we can take a step backwards and take a look at how this compares to other Bionicle builds. Specifically, I'll be comparing it against its comic artwork, but I'll also be comparing it against several other Glatorian and maybe some other characters that it may run into along its journeys to see if it poses a threat and scales well against those other characters. So let's take a step back and compare this model against the others. All right, so to compare alongside the Batera, I have brought along some members of the Skrull. We have a standard Skrull warrior, Stronius, who is one of the elite warriors, and we have a Bone Hunter there for good measure as well, specifically Atakus. And the Batera would come into major conflict with these characters because it is programmed to target anyone carrying a weapon, which these folks really love to do. So in terms of this posing a significant threat against these warriors, 
You know, I can definitely see it. Because if you look at a lot of these scrawls, especially Stronius here, it seems like this character would move slowly and have a strong attack, whereas the Vatera seems to be a lot more agile, using the claws as quick weapons to really take these guys down, and it really definitely feels like if you had a patrol group of Skrull against a bunch of Vatera, they wouldn't really stand a chance. I really do also appreciate how they're about the same height in universe. This is in scale with the comics, which depicted them as about the height of a Glatorian, maybe a little bit taller, but basically about the same height. It wasn't the height or size that intimidated people, it was more of their technology and their way to immediately take down anyone carrying weapons. All in all, I think that this fits in quite well into the Glatorian and Barra Magna universe. I honestly don't have many complaints, and if we compare it against the picture from the comics up on the screen here, you'll notice that it actually works out very, very well in terms of looking directly like the comics counterpart. Sure, some of the pieces just don't exist in white, like some of the spikes here, but in general, I think changing the spike color to silver, especially to accommodate the available pieces from LEGO's inventory, was a good decision. And it honestly works out very well for making this model have a unique color balance. So in terms of fitting in the universe and looking good compared to the in-universe counterpart that's been hand-drawn, I'm going to give this one a straight 10 out of 10. I have basically no complaints. It really does look perfect, exactly like it appeared in the comics, so I'm very, very happy with that. Moving on, though, we can start to take a look at some of the other points as I move these guys aside here, zooming in just close on the Batera. I want to start off with the pose ability because that may or may not be the weakest aspect of this build, and I say that relatively speaking because everything else about this is so good. The only really thing that I can think of in terms of some cons or poseability is the fact that you can't really move the arm up past this point. Even the head is a little bit restricted in articulation depending on how you angle these specific joints. So really, that's the only thing kind of going against it. Otherwise, poseability is really good. And again, as I said at the end of the day, all that really matters is that you can get it into cool looking poses, which you can immediately and quickly do without the model falling over like many of the other models. So I'm going to give poseability an 8 out of 10. I think that I would really like to have a little bit more articulation possibilities with the arms here, especially the upper arms, but I can get it into good poses, so can I even complain too too much about that? Which is why I'm still giving it a relatively high score despite it not being able to pose in certain areas. Then moving on to building techniques. I am very, very impressed with the building techniques, as I usually am with builds from Wombat Combat Pictures, who is quickly proving himself to be one of the best Bionicle canon Machus in this era. Again, the torso is a great way of showing that the Anika build isn't just stale and doesn't just feel the same. You can immediately see how this Anika build is different from any of the other Anika builds here. And I really do appreciate the efforts taken to give it a bit of a hunchback with this whole Technic construction in the back. The excellent building techniques continue to the arms, with these spikes being mounted in a very clever way to the traditional Anika shoulder pads, as well as the upper legs here, which again are built quite well. My only quibble, and that's a very minor one, is that if you're kind of holding this carelessly or not really looking where you're holding, again, really easy to pop out the front armor piece because it's only adhered by one Technic axle, and the way that it's angled means that if you apply any pressure downwards on the knee, that thing's just gonna pop off. Then again though, aesthetically, I think it looks really great. So in terms of building techniques, I'm just gonna give this one a nine out of 10. Really, that's the only complaint I can really think of in terms of the techniques. Everything else is done pretty well. And despite obviously not being able to move the arms up too, too much, it doesn't hamper posability that much. And I can't think of an easy way to fix it without changing the way the arms work pretty radically. But then we can move on to the final point, which is aesthetics. And overall, I'm gonna give aesthetics a 10 out of 10. Love the color blocking on this, really love the piece usages. And especially when you look at how well these different pieces from different eras of Lego building techniques work with each other, I'm actually kind of shocked at how well they work together. From the CCBS armor pads, to the Hero Factory knee joints, the Knight's Kingdom mace armor, LX G1 spikes, and the Biddle claws on the feet. Every single silver piece on this build feels like it fits within the right universe, the same universe, and feels like they all belong for this character. 
It's really well done and even beyond just those specific parts usages, I really do appreciate the attempts to do color blocking and even fill in the gaps in the Technic build by the use of just one by one standard Lego studs, kind of just filling in the gaps there. All in all, very, very impressed with how this one looks. Honestly, I feel like this looks even a lot cooler than the way it was depicted in the comics. We never got a good view of these in the comics because they were always surrounded by a snowstorm. Couldn't really see exactly what was going on there, but I love that seeing this clearly gives it its own unique color scheme of the white and the dark blue and some silver. And this really definitely feels like a character that you would not want to come across, especially in the middle of a blizzard. But with that, I think we've about summed up this review of Batera, a bit of a shorter one this time because it is a smaller model, but don't let its size fool you because it is definitely one of the most sophisticated models you're going to see canonized. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is not technically canon, but I'm only reviewing it because of a few things. For one, because we already have a visual depiction of Batera hand-drawn in canon, then there is no need to do a canon contest because we already know what it looks like. This is just the best build that I could find online that approximates the actual in-universe model very well. But so, that about sums up this review of the Batera. Let me know down in the comments below what did you think of this model, and are you okay if I continue to review some stuff like this, which technically are not officially canon, but represent the in-universe canon depictions to a very high and sophisticated degree. Again, let me know down in the comments as well if there are any models that you want to see reviewed next, and as always, tune in to Duck Bricks every Monday for every new Bionicle fan and review. Thank you all for tuning in, and I'll talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye for now.